Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, we'll get started then. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, this will be a lecture on on whip speeches. Um, in essence, some some thoughts on what to do and what not to do. I think the the thing that I want to make clear before we get started is a disclaimer, is that obviously at different points in your development, different pieces of of advice and guidance in this lecture will be less or more pertinent to you guys. Um, I've tried to insert insights that will be relevant even if you're you're just beginning to give whip speeches and want to learn how the mechanics of them work properly or if you're for example breaking uh, on, on the edge of breaking an international or trying to break deep how best to go about it and I'll make sure to segment which insights I think are particularly relevant um, for each of, the, of those kinds of speakers um, beyond that the thing I want to say is that uh, I will definitely take a host of questions at the end. There were some questions that were already asked to me, which I'll, I'll either address directly through through this presentation or address at the end. But if you feel like there's a pressing question on something that I am covering in the moment, feel free to type it uh, in the chat. And I think um, the, the people at AU are also gonna type some of the comments from the YouTube live stream in the chat too. So I'll make sure to answer them as I go along. Uh, Okay, let's get started then. Uh, I think the first thing is um, just some do nots um, that I'm gonna flag at the beginning that will become clearer as we, we, we go along. The first do not of whip speeches is uh, a thing that I flagged here as a terrible trend in debating of non-rebuttal. And I wanna flag the importance of rebuttal explicitly here, just so you're aware of it. I think much of the advice that I'll be giving is how you deploy your rebuttal. And therefore it is a complete non-starter if the majority of whip speeches you are currently giving uh, do not feature mostly rebuttal. I think it's very important that you guys understand why that's the case. And we'll get to the mechanics and the theory of it in a moment, but I think uh, do not under any circumstances revert to whip speeches in which you generically weigh abstract priorities as a substitute for actual response. Uh, it makes it very difficult to judge those debates and it likely means you do not get the credit that you otherwise would have gotten had you engaged in direct responses. The second thing that I wanna flag as a complete non-starter is uh, I think repetition of various responses, etc. I think in an attempt to uh, make team by team speech is very clear to judges, um, even when there is no real delineation in the, in the material between two teams or no real difference in the response that you'd give to material from both, uh, both sides of the bench. Um, there's, there's a tendency to repeat in a lot of the uh, judging that I've done, uh, which is quite frankly inefficient and a waste of your time. You have seven minutes to both rebuild and rebut uh, weigh all of that stuff. And I think it's important to maximize efficiency. And the last thing is, I think it's very important not to leave any priorities or uh, intuitions implicit in your, in your cases. I think WIP is the perfect place to explicate a lot of the insights you have that you think that'll be important in the way that the debate is adjudicated. So don't leave those insights up to the judge to pull out. I'd recommend you get ahead of them. All of these will become clearer, but I, want, I wanted to start with these uh, just as a, as a flag, even for the people who are getting started, why um, these things are, are definitely no-go zones. And I hope you see the rest of the lecture through some of this lens. So before uh, we get on to sort of my, my tips on, on whip speeches, I want to revise the objective of BP debating just so that uh, it gives intent to your whip speeches. Because I think the best whip speeches are ones that have a comprehensive and quite in-depth understanding of what whip speeches uh, are supposed to do in the context of BP debating specifically. So I think as I've flagged here, winning in BP debating is unique, but it's also extremely unpredictable. And I think what uh, WIP does is that it provides you a, a, a point of predictability where it does not exist. You have seen the debate play out. You have seen all of the speeches, essentially, unless you're Gov WIP, and even still, you've seen the vast majority of them. 
you've got uh, a clear thing that you have to defend in that extension. And I think given the unpredictability of comparisons and of judging, WIP is a unique place at which you can exploit uh, the fact that you come late in the debate and that you can uh, you can win the debate quite clearly from, from there. But I think the general theory with BP debating and once the three dynamics to keep in, t- in, in mind is that I think one, you win on three direct comparisons. Uh, and the way you take a first is by ensuring that on all three comparisons, you win the debate. And it's very important that the way that you structure and prioritize your speech is cognizant that you have to win three direct comparisons rather than uh, pushing your extension in the abstract, for example, or doing rebuttal without much of a focus of how, how to take a first in a debate or spending too much time killing one team, etc. It's important to re- recognize that there are always three direct comparisons in, in a debate. The second thing is, though, that those three direct comparisons, you have to win within the within constraints of, of the, the structure and the format. There's constraints on time. There's constraints on the novelty of material that you have to run. There's constraints on the plausibility of material, i.e. even if things are analytically true, it might be the case that judges don't see them as being plausible. You have constraints on the type of judging that you might receive, different, uh, different regional priorities in the way that judging Uh, occurs. And you also have constraints in the way that material plays out. So for example, if you're in closing, you are obviously constrained by the way that the opening sets out the debate. And it's very, it's very important that those three direct comparisons happen within the framework of those constraints, and you're aware of all of them. So I've described it here as a constraint optimization exercise. But I think what I'm getting at here is that all of these things need to be Uh, present in your thinking as you're deciding what to do. Seven minutes to win a debate from WIP requires balancing a lot of different constraints with the explicit objective of winning on three direct comparisons. And as long as you are very clear that that is the focus of any WIP speech, you're likely to make sure that your prioritization is correct. Rather than giving bizarre rebuttal or rather than spending seven minutes on uh, a team in OO, for example, if you're at Gulf Whip, because you thought it'd be funny to make fun of them, which I personally have done before. But as long as you're disciplined and aware of that objective, um, it's most of the prioritization material that will come later uh, will become very clear to you in its importance. So that's the objective. Uh, I want to do a quick note on extension construction and closing strategy, but obviously that is not the purpose of this lecture, so it'll be very brief. Uh, I think this is important for background in terms of where the best WIP speeches come and what the types of things that you should be considering at WIP are with respect to closing strategy. So the first thing that I want to flag is where I think the optimal WIP speeches come from. And they follow extension speeches that uh, I think are all of the things listed here, but I want to um, concentrate on mechanistic robustness. I think there are a lot of things that you can get away with at WIP. Um, And I think there are many ways that you can manipulate uh, impacts or rebuttal or context or characterization. But I think the thing that is most difficult to get away with introducing at WIP is an explanation of how the impacts or extension come to be. What are the, the, the mechanisms that are behind your extension? And I think therefore any optimal WIP speech will come after an extension speech that at the very least is mechanistically robust enough such that uh, the main benefits of the extension stand within the confines of the extension speech. And of course, you can defend that those core mechanisms, you can add characterization, you can do intuition pumps that show that those mechanisms are plausible, but the actual explanation of how those mechanisms work and lead to an end outcome must come in the extension speech. And it is very, very difficult to win at WIP if your extension speaker does limited work in showing how the outcomes come about. I think there are debates in which even outcomes and impacts have been very unclear in in the extension speech of my partner in some instances, but I've been able to get away with the fact that those were unclear because the mechanisms were there. Whereas it is very difficult to have a set of outcomes and impacts in your extension speech without mechanisms and providing the mechanisms in WIP. So always make sure that you pay attention to that equally noting the importance of mechanistic robustness. I think it's important for you to critically assess where your mechanisms rest at the end of the extension speech. So you can provide uh, 
support to them where they're lacking. So obviously the analysis needs to be there, but if you think that there's a problem of plausibility, if you think there's a problem of um, characterization, whatever it might be, you, you add, you prioritize adding material there. Um, so I think that's the optimal whip speech. It follows those, those criteria there. Um, I think quality over quantity is also an important thing to flag because as a whip speaker, it's very difficult to whip multiple pieces of material that are you know, solid at best in demonstrating why you win three explicit comparisons versus one very, very good fleshed out argument that you can um, cohesively compare to any other contribution in the debate. And to that extent, I think uh, it's important for you to prioritize in extension having quality over quantity. Um, I think I've flagged here what tools that are available to you at WIP um, beyond that, beyond what happens at extension. So you can't, I think, in my opinion, do most of the mechanistic robustness stuff that I was talking about, but you can flesh out an impact beyond the central selection of that impact at, um, at member. Uh, you can do a lot of rebuttal and weighing. You can do a lot of the strategic positioning. And I think that's where most of the focus of your speeches ought be. Um, the last note I want to make here is one that I think is important if you, for example, have gone through the Euros prep season being a little bit frustrated by the types of calls that you've been getting, feel that your team has been a little bit susceptible to, to being rep charged out of certain positions, etc. I think that the constructing uh, a, a whip speech framework for yourself and a closing strategy uh, that is very clear means that by the time you get to euros you're most likely to overcome a lot of rep judging and social corruption that happens at large international tournaments because I think the whip speech and closing in particular allow you to influence margins and in and an adjudication in a way that very few other positions are so I think when you get closing it's very important uh, to be clear and to to have a control of your strategy in a way that's that's difficult uh, at other positions. Um, so I think it is a unique chance for you to overcome some of the difficulties you might have been facing in the prep season. Cool, uh, awesome. The first thing that I'm gonna look at, look at then is uh, a framework for whip speeches. Um, I got a number of questions in the lead up to this about whether you do team by team or issues. And I think uh, the, the answer that I have is, uh, it depends to some extent on the debate and what you're comfortable with. But I believe that any proper whip structure should prioritize some, some combination of the two extremes, which is a very focused whip speech on making comparisons between each of the two teams, but also with an emphasis on, on the issues within the debate rather than extraneous sort of pieces of material that come out from the other side. So prioritizing the correct issues whilst also making sure that you tie those issues back to a team by team comparison is very important. Uh, I don't buy into the thinking that if you are giving a team by team whip, you're missing out on the things that are important in debates. I think a team by team whip often imposes a focus um, that reminds you of what your objective in the debate is, going back to the, the first slide we were talking about. Um, and, and, and to that end, I think the team by team whip is important. I'll give an example structure as to what I do a bit later on, but it attempts to put both a, a focus of team of those team comparisons and the issues in the debate together uh, in a way that I think gets rewarded quite quite heavily. Uh, so very quickly, the things that I will look at, um, I think whip speeches do three things. The first is strategic positioning of the extension. So why does the extension comparatively win the debate in and of itself? And this will be the first and primary piece of uh, weighing that you do that'll win you most debates. And in instances where you think you're winning, it'll, it'll allow you to win by large margins because it shows that irrespective of engaging in rebuttal or whatever other considerations in the debate, you guys have constructed a case at extension that's so robust that it wins the debate outright. And I think that strategic positioning of the extension is both important such that the judge sees your extension and your material um, credibly and thinks that it is legitimate, but also because it makes it very clear to um, to, to the judge what your path to victory is in the debate. How does the material that you have pushed out win the debate outside of the rebuttal and the, the rebuilding and all of the other things that you're going to do? So having a, a, a section of your speech or whether it's throughout where you 
use pieces of your extension to show why they explicitly win on other teams' metrics or why the impacts are in and of themselves debate winning as compared to the other things that have come out is very important. Uh, it is very unlikely that you'll win debates by having a super, super small and irrelevant extension and by doing a huge amount of rebuttal in rooms that are quite tough. And to that extent, showing uh, relevance, showing uniqueness, showing potency of your extension through that strategic positioning is important. And we'll talk about what that process entails. The second thing I have is uh, I think rebu rebuilding internal strategic commentary and rebuttal is I think the second pillar of all whip speeches. And I'd flagged here that it's important to do that in that order. I'll explain why in a moment, but I think this is what most people think that whip speeches largely are. And it is uh, like the, the majority of the, the grunt work that you're going to do in a whip speech. But um, I think it is important to recognize what role each of these things plays and we'll discuss that. And finally, uh, weighing rebuilt extensions against refuted claims from the other side makes it easier for you to win debates uh, and makes, makes, de makes debates fair essentially because you're not weighing, um, you know, uh, you're not weighing a claim that in and of itself compared to something that is extremely small. Um, so what this does for the judge essentially is it says, even if you don't buy my extension outright and that it doesn't win the debate outright, as compared to all the other claims from the other side, which I have refuted or I have uh, mitigated, whatever it might be, obviously this rebuilt extension that we have is more important. So we'll look at the process of that, but this is basically like the contingency that all whip speeches uh, should have there so that they can win on multiple levels. Uh, so given that, I think we'll also talk about firstly, strategic positioning of your extension. The first thing about strategic positioning and a prerequisite of it is to position your extension as being uh, legitimate in the debate. And what I mean by legitimate is uh, that it overcomes the basic um, requirement of role fulfillment in, in a debate. And I think particularly in some circuits like the European circuit, I've found there is a tendency to heavily penalize closing teams, even though they have very good responses or very good mitigation and, and refutation to the other side, if they don't have a quote unquote extension. So one of the most important things, uh, especially if you're going to a tournament like Euros, is at least allocating a bit of time showing that both your, your extension is both novel in the sense that it is different from your opening, but also robust, um, and, and showing why, why the mechanisms have either not been engaged with or really important in the debate. I think this process of legitimacy, legitimization of your extension always requires a direct comparison with your opening, uh, both in terms of what is explicitly different. So judges can't call you out for being derivative, but also in terms of why you did things either better or why what you chose was more important in the debate. So positioning your extension always requires firstly that you legitimize your extension in WIP. And I, I would prioritize putting stuff like this in the introduction, especially when judges are a little bit unsure as to what how, how novel your extensions are. That happens with analysis extensions that we'll talk about uh, in a bit. But uh, I think legitimization is first. Um, the second thing is, uh, I think showing what the impacts of that extension are in, in debates. So I would select two to three in your whip speech that you think uh, are most important. And I would do so with the following criterion. The first criterion that I would select my, the impacts that I push in my whip speech with are what are the metrics that other teams have set for themselves in the debate and which of these impacts is most likely to win on the basis of those metrics out, uh, outright. And the reason that I would ask that question is that it gives you the easiest path to victory because it it doesn't dispute on what grounds the debate should be won on. It just shows that even if we select the grounds of another team, we win. So if there's an impact that you think wins the debate for you on all of the other team's metrics, select that impact. If it is the case that that impact doesn't exist in your case, and each of the teams does have completely conflicting priorities, the impact that you select is the one that 
uh, you think is easiest to prove as being more important than an impact from the other side. So these impacts might be more intuitive. So an example that I'm uh, that you might give for, uh, in a debate is, uh, for instance, about legalizing drugs or something of that sort. And an impact from closing Gulf that you might have is about... Um, you know, recreational drug use is, is something that people should be able to engage in. And there are actually benefits to individuals for doing that. Um, obviously not, not, a, not a super compelling claim, but say that is your claim. Um, and the other side says, no, 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 drugs are awful. I think you would pick that specific impact because it is most at, at odds and in contrast with the other side, but it is also intuitive to show why that would be more important. So if all teams disagree about what is important in the debate, pick the most intuitive one and the one that directly contrasts for the judge where you stand. Uh, and the last thing about positioning your extension is why should the judge buy your extension outright? And here, I think I would um, give some, some reasons and uh, some characterization and explanation as to why even if you buy everything from every other team in the debate why your thing is the most important and you do this uh at any at any speech where you engage in weighing but here i think what you're doing is you're basically providing the case for the judge that within two minutes into your whip speech you've already won and the rest of the whip speech is an exercise in just in increasing margins. So why should the judge buy your extension outright is where you insert all of the traditional piece of weighing that you might have on scale, on capacity, et cetera, um, or uniqueness. And uh, I think you compare them to, to the other teams, assuming that all of their benefits uh, stand by the end of the debate. So that's, I think the, the, the first piece of any good whip speech should be positioning your extension in this way. Where you place this is uh, up to you in the end. And I think it's very debate dependent. I personally have a three minute sort of monologue at the beginning of all of my whip speeches that do all of these things before I engage in explicit rebuttal and refutation. Um, just to flag what the extension is, why it's legitimate, why it's important, why it should win the debate, even if I do no rebuttal whatsoever in the mind of the judge. So I can spend the next four minutes actually increasing the margins, or um, if that explanation doesn't pay off, um, make make it clear to the judge that even if that, that explanation is not bought, that uh, when you weigh these things after they play out in the debate, why you should prioritize our claims. But yeah. That might be one way you do it. The other way you might position your extension is if you have multiple pieces, pieces of extension that uh, hit different issues, you might um, prioritize them at the beginning of each issue and say something like, the first issue is this, our claim on this specific issue was X. Obviously X was the most important claim compared to Y and Z, which come from the other teams in this debate. Uh, so we win outright. But even if we don't win outright, here is why X wins uh, compared to Y and Z when you examine those claims after resolving rebuttal and weighing, et cetera. So you might do it at the beginning of each, each of the themes as well. Uh, but it's really important that you make the case to the judge that your extension wins outright. Cool. Awesome. Um, I will get some, to some of the questions in the chat at the end because I think they more neatly fit into latter parts of it. So that's the first piece, uh, first pillar of good whip speeches. Um, the second thing is, sorry. Uh, yeah, the second thing is um, on rebuttal rebuilding and strategic commentary. And I believe this is the second pillar and the place where you'll do most of the grunt work. The reason that I've selected this order I think the second and third are more interchangeable, but the first is um, definitely non-negotiable. The thing that you should begin all of your whip speeches with when you're doing the grunt work is that if you are, if you insufficiently rebuild your extension from the attacks of the other side, then you know the judge doesn't really have um, the the basis to to provide you the debate because you're arguing that you win on the basis of an extension that is no longer the same as what you argued it was. It's now what the opposition refuted it to be. 
So they're basically taking a refuted extension and weighing that against the rest of the debate rather than a robust extension and weighing it against the rest of the debate. So it's really important that if you're speaking WIP, the first thing that you do is that you rebuild your extension. And I think there are three things here that I have about rebuilding extensions. The first thing is you need to pinpoint where the extension is unintuitive and explain that. And this goes to a point of plausibility that I was making earlier. It might be the case that you have a substantive extension that's very analytically well proven, but a judge just believes that the extension is completely implausible and chucks it out. This is not great judging, but it's the unfortunate reality of much judging um, around the world. And unfortunately, it's important when you think you're running a particularly counterintuitive uh, extension or the judge is not fully buying the intuition of your extensions to, to pick the places in which you think is unintuitive and rebuild the intuitions there. That's the most important one if the mechanisms and all of that other stuff is intact. The second thing is critically listening to your member speech to determine where the gaps in extension are. Uh, and what I mean by this is obviously most of the mechanisms should be there, but say, for example, there is a, a gap in characterization that you think needs more, more work and explanation, or there's a gap in um, weighing incentives of various actors that your extension is contingent on. So it's really important for you to listen to your own extension speaker, much like you would listen to a, a speaker in of any other team in the debate such that you're responding to them. But in this case, you're gonna use the information that you get from listening to your own member speaker to, to provide the gaps uh, additional weight. And the reason this is particularly important um, at, at GovWhip is because obviously OpWhip can exploit a lot of those gaps if you don't fill them in. But even at OpWhip is if you don't fill those gaps in, you don't know to what extent the, the judge will penalize you for having those gaps in your explanation. So it's really important uh, that you don't that you don't uh, take the risk on that and that the, the judge at the end of your op whip speech has a, a cohesive extension that they can weigh against all of the other teams rather than ones with gaps, which you don't know uh, where they'll fall in the eyes of the judge. Um, so make sure you're taking critical and honest notes about where your member speaker has made mistakes and where the gaps lie and make sure you, you make inroads there. The final thing is, and this is obviously what most people conceive of as rebuilding, um, but still I think is done reasonably poorly because either teams don't go far enough in the rebuilding process or are not honest with themselves, is listening to the ex exact responses that come from the other side uh, and making sure you rebuild the ones that are really pressing and urgent. And this will require you to um, literally write down the responses one by one. You shouldn't be doing anything other than listening to the speaker right before you, um, when they're refuting your, your extension, shouldn't be writing rebuttal to their extension or anything of that sort. It should be time that is dedicated to listening to the exact responses from the other side, deciding which of the ones are worst for you and making sure those ones by the end of your whip speech are rebuilt. Um, and there are ways to go about this. Uh, if there's a mechanistic response, obviously you can add rebuttal here or, or rebuilding here to suggest that that is untrue from the other side. If it's plausibility attack, make sure you do this stuff about making your extensions more intuitive. If there are claims from the other side about how there's uh, no mutually ex mutual exclusivity. Um, you can obviously add an explanation of mutual exclusivity here. And I think this goes to a lot of the questions that were being asked um, in prior to this lecture about what constitutes new material or not. And my like secret tip, I guess, is that the place where you can insert a lot of new material without judges penalizing you in a way that would be catastrophic is by inserting it into, um, into your rebuilding um, such that it looks like you're just defending your extension rather than providing new material uh, that shouldn't be counted. But if you don't rebuild from that, you're not gonna win because in the explicit comparisons, now you have a poor extension that's weighed against OG, OO, CO, for example, rather than one that is rebuilt and robust. Um, I have a few things to look at with respect to rebuttal here, but this is not a rebuttal workshop, but one that 
I think these these five, you know, if you are listening to um, a case from the other side and you're trying to refute it, if you ask what is the comparative, is this claim comparative? Is this the correct characterization? Is this particular argument the tipping point for their harms to occur? Is the mechanism complete such that their outcome and their mechanisms cohere together? Or is the outcome far larger than what their mechanisms suggest the outcome would be? Um, how do I mitigate this claim such that I make the, the argument smaller? If you just ask these questions critically as claims from the other side are coming out, it's really easy to think of, of responses. I think one of the questions that I was asked is, how do you do so much uh, at once? And it's just, as teams are speaking and, make, and forwarding their central claims, you ask any of these questions and you very quickly come up with responses to, to, any, to, any, to the other side. Um, and even if they don't come straight away, these provide frameworks for responses that you might do some more legwork into showing. So uh, a, claim might, a team might make a claim on uh, this leads to backlash and then it might be a good claim even, but asking yourselves about these five types of responses, I guess, uh, you might identify that obviously the one that it is most susceptible to is the tipping point, i.e. would backlash occur on either side of the house, in which case this is clearly not the tipping point, and you might do some legwork to explain why that's the case. Or more likely, especially in sort of mid-tier rooms, is you ask any of these five critically as you're listening to the other side, and you come up with responses straight away, like this claim is obviously uncomparative or the characterization of this claim is obviously incorrect. So I can reject its premise or clearly the outcome, you know, some, the U S leaving the UN is not something that at all is coherent with the, the mechanisms they give, which is Donald Trump's a bit angry, for example, in a debate. Uh, and to that extent, in most rooms, if you just ask these, it's very easy to come up with those responses. Um, but make sure you do direct rebuttal work, as I flagged at the very, very beginning. The last thing here is on strategic commentary. And I think this is very important, especially if, if you're a team that um, feels very frustrated at the moment that the judge is not recognizing all the good work you're doing. And this, I think, is the debating equivalent of spoon feeding your judge. Uh, and that is making sure you're telling the judge how you intend to win. Um, the, the debate or a specific comparison. So you might say uh, at the beginning of an issue, opening government's claims were heavily contingent on backlash manifesting. If we could prove to you that backlash would not manifest and instead people would uh, cohesively engage with a social group, then they lose the debate. And that way the judge very clearly sees how you intend on winning the comparison and can track the rebuttal and the rebuilding that you make in the context of that strategic commentary um, and, and, and it really makes it difficult for, for judges to discount because you've gone from A, which is an point A, which is an explanation of how you're going to win, all the grunt work in between, which is rebuttal rebuilding, and then point C, which is an explanation of where you've left the debate. Uh, and that, I think, is the second part of strategic commentary is after you've done all the good work, it's almost like collecting your trophy at the end of the day and saying, so I have shown you X, which has Y impact on the opening government case, which means at the end of the debate, you're actually weighing a, a worse opening government case than you had initially thought. And when weighing that worse opening government case to what we bring you, it's clear they lose the debate. Uh, and just providing uh, a wrapping up of issues such that the judge is easily able to um, litigate between them is I think the way to go on that. Um, Cool. So the last thing then is on weighing, not weighing analysis extensions. Uh, it's on weighing generally. So you at this point have given judges the, a reason why you've, your extension already wins the debate in and of itself. You've given them huge, uh, huge number of responses. You've rebuilt your extension you've explained what you're gonna do, you've done most of the grunt work. Now the, the, this last skill that you deploy at WIT is almost like a, you know, a, an insurance policy. Um, it's you weigh all of the good legwork you've done to affect different teams' cases to all of the legwork you've done to make sure that your case is still robust. 
and bring it all together for the judge. And I think there are two types of weighing that you should do in your whip speech. The first is uh, internal weighing, which I think at times will come in the form of, of rebuttal, but I wanna, um, I wanna flag it in this section um, as an explicit thing, just so uh, you guys remember that in, in, in debates, characterization comparisons often can, can you win you the debate wholesale. So these in, internal weighing in such scenarios is basically um, identifying characterizations that are contentious and weighing which one is more likely in a debate. And doing this level of weighing will often win you clashes where you're directly comparing uh, which side gets the same benefits, for example, or which side gets the same harm, but it's worse. And in those instances, internal weighing really helps you tip the scales in your favor. Uh, and that's something to, to really do in debates about social movements or political strategy, et cetera, that internal weighing is really important. But I think the vast majority of weighing you'll do in the way that I'm describing, which is bringing all of your work together, is external weighing. And this is weighing discrete and distinctive outcomes. Uh, against each other. And this is where you say, oh, gee, you know, we've given four or five responses to them. So say they initially claimed that a thousand people were helped. We've proven by the end of the responses that we've given you at OpWhip that only 50 people are helped, which means if you compare opening governments, 50 people being helped at the end of our rebuttal versus the thousand people we help at the end of our rebuilding and our extension, it's very clear that we win this debate. Or opening government wants X priority. We think X priority is wrong for all of these reasons. We want to instead pursue Y priority. And obviously Y priority is more important. If we go back to, for example, the drug debate, obviously we think enabling free choice is more important than the harms, uh, than preventing some of these harms. And this might be the reason why. And just doing the external weighing and tying that all together. So as I said, uh, I think there's a contingency because even if your judge doesn't buy your initial strategic positioning about why you win in and of itself, it makes it much easier for you to win if you just compare mitigated and defeated claims to robust claims from your side. And I think uh, this is, it's it, the best thing about this is you've already done most of the legwork. This is just about explaining how that legwork um, ties into to weighing specific issues. Uh, and I think you should do this at the end of, in if you give issue by issue whips at the end of each issue, um, if you're doing team by team whips, you should do it by showing what the state of the other team's case is and comparing that directly and weighing it against yours. Uh, but it should definitely come at the end of your legwork rather than um, at the beginning. So I think in some ways your strategic positioning and your weighing is similar, but I have flagged this particular slide on weighing and the things described in it as a process that you undergo when you've done most of the legwork um, rather than the strategic positioning that happens when you show why you win the debate in and of itself. So these are the three skills that I think are important for any whip to understand and master. And based on the debate, you will change the intensity with which they're deployed, uh, you'll change the structure, you'll change where you, you prioritize, but all good whip speeches will have an explanation of why you win and of itself, why the other team's cases are a bit poor, essentially, and why your claim is robust, and how those things weigh out. And if you do that for three distinct comparisons, then you're very, very likely to take take the debate and win it. I think the important thing with all of this and something that I'm gonna flag a little bit later is that this requires uh, complete honesty with what the other teams run. So you aren't doing applying these skills improperly uh, such that the judge doesn't believe you or obviously your rebuttal is disingenuous and doesn't do what you, what you want it to. But also honesty with respect to your own case so that you do the requisite legwork um, such that you demonstrate why um, why a thing that might sound unintuitive in the way that it comes out is actually in fact a debate winning impact rather than assuming that obviously it was intuitive so it'll win us the debate. Otherwise you'll be disappointed. Um, it's very important to be honest with yourselves as to what comes out of the other side in your own case then. Awesome. Um, a quick note on GovWhip, uh, but before that I'm going to do some stuff on, on prioritizing material. So the, the question is asked then, how do I apply these skills and in what, what order slash 
to, to what teams do I do it to? I think there are three things about prioritization that are very important. The first and most important thing, and this is, I, I think, the thing that costs most closing uh, teams debates, especially at mid-tier levels, is that if you're in closing government and you run a case on, say, Donald Trump's incentives, and you say, obviously, Donald Trump will not do X thing, uh, and you give lots of reasons as to why that's the case, and you're very happy with yourself because you think, you think you've proven why Donald Trump will not do X thing. Um, and then opening opposition, though, has already given a number of reasons why Donald Trump will do the exact opposite to what you're claiming that they will do. And you haven't engaged with those explicitly, which means by the end of the debate, it becomes very, very difficult to judge uh, which, which of the things is correct, which means at closing, it's very important to first target things that you hear clash with your extension directly or harm your extension's chances of standing. So these might be characterizations that are incorrect and you obviously have to get rid of in order to win the debate. These might be preemptions from the other side as to why something is or is not a tipping point and you have to get rid of it in order to show, for example, something is in fact the tipping point. Or it might be um, an argument on, on incentives or whatever it might be. But if it directly clashes with you and it's a contrarian claim, i.e. one that suggests that the opposite thing will happen, you have to get rid of that claim first in order for your extension to stand. I think this requires two things from, from you. The first is an honest appraisal of what was said uh, by the team earlier in the debate with respect to that argument, directly refuting those reasons as to why the opposite claim to what you're claiming will happen and making sure that those reasons don't stand. But also, and most importantly, explicitly weighing those reasons at the end of the debate, uh, such that at the end of the debate, it's clear to the judge which of these outcomes is more likely, the, the opposite outcome the opening opposition suggests or your outcome in closing government. Um, and without you doing the weighing for the judge, it becomes very difficult for the judge to litigate between these two uh, outcomes. And often um, the opening opposition, given the amount of time they have, they have two speakers, et cetera, um, to, they will uh, get a fair bit of material and they'll matter drop. And a lot of the implicit material might be credited ahead of what you said. And unfortunately, there's a bias towards punishing closing teams because they have more time for not doing a lot of this legwork. So it's most important to get rid of claims that are already floating in the debate that harm your extension from standing before you do anything else. Um, and this might be explicit responses or material, as I said, or implicit responses um, on characterization or whatever it might be. Uh, but this requires meticulous tracking of what the teams in the top half in particular say just so you can even catch implicit responses that might harm you. Because the best judges will pick up on implicit responses and gauge how they interact with your case. Uh, and if you haven't dealt with them, then you're in trouble um, if those implicit responses are reasonably robust. The second thing to prioritize then after you've made sure that all material that compromises your extension is basically has basically been disproven is, pra is disproven is practicing risk aversion. Um, so especially in in rounds, um, having two Having one point is better better than having zero points, and having two points is better than having um, one point. And I mean, and to that extent, I think it means avoiding a fourth before anything else. So using your whip speech, unless it's it's super 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 clear that a team has taken a fourth, and you don't need to engage with them at all, I think it is. Uh, it is very important that you prevent yourself from taking the fourth, whether that be in the first 30 seconds, the first minute, the first three minutes, uh, because then you you aren't fourthing and you, you're you obviously on a better on better track towards the break. Um, rather than running, rather than, for example, being very close to a team on the third, fourth uh, split, but deciding, no, I really want to take out the team that's coming first and risk coming fourth. Trust me, first or fourth extensions or whip strategies are not worth it the vast majority of instances. Um, and working your way upwards is always better in terms of an expected points, essentially, total that you will have. So 
kill the team that you think is coming fourth and then kill the team that you think is coming uh, third or second and then kill the team that you think you have to beat in order to take a first in that order, uh, especially in in rounds. I think in out rounds, this makes sense as well. You only have to take a second in order to um, go through in most out rounds except a grand final. Um, and I think in those out rounds, picking two teams that you want to kill in order to get through is important. So just think about the easiest way for you to maximize points in the round and the easiest way to, for you to kill two teams in a round, in an out round, and focus uh, on dealing with, with that before you do anything else. So risk aversion is very important. The last thing I have as to how to prioritize material is reading the judge and the round reaction to your extension and prioritizing accordingly. I have a, a I have a disclaimer here, which is obviously you take it with a grain of salt because different judges react differently. But often it's very easy to tell whether a judge in the round is buying your extension or not, whether they think it is intuitive or not. And if you think there is a specific part about the extension that they're not buying, and it's important for you to that for you that that particular piece of extension stands, spend time on bolstering its intuitions, grounding it in the real world such that judges know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and making sure that the judge's reactions change. Um, or if a judge obviously buys a particular argument um, and all the mechanisms associated with it, spending four minutes is a reasonable waste of time there. Um, so don't, don't do that either. Uh, so reading the judge can often be quite a helpful way to prioritize that. And, and obviously if the other team gets up and uh, really flippantly dismisses your extension, but it sounds compelling in the way that they they dismiss it. It, it it'll take a lot of work in the next speech but it's important for you to reclaim the narrative of your extension um so if they say what a dumb extension ha 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 you know you want to make sure that by the end of your whip speech all of the reasons as to why your extension sound really stupid coming out of the other team do not stand anymore so bolstering wherever the the weaknesses would be in, in comparison to the, the reactions of the round is also a way that you might prioritize. Um, yeah, so very quickly, uh, note on Gov Whip. Um, I, I think uh, the, the thing about Gov Whip is I think in, in many ways, it's the most difficult position in the debate. There's a lot of legwork to be done you know, through all of the things that I was talking about with respect to your own extension, but you also uh, have heard an extension from the other side and you have to get rid of it immediately and that that is quite a difficult task to do um and and if you do it incorrectly it just means that the op whip whom no one responds to has a lot of maneuvering capacity so to prevent an op whip from being able to control an entire debate and to ensure that you take it over your co team um i think the the best way to do so is to think of structural responses with uh the, the CO case. And what I mean by structural responses are ones that are mechanistic in nature, because as I said, uh, it's very difficult for um, a whip speaker to rebuild mechanisms without judges seeing it as new material, or even just rebuild something that's so important to their case uh, for a long period of time, because they'd have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. So if you just rebut the how, the mechanisms, that is often a, a sufficient way to put an op whip on the back foot um, and makes it very difficult for them to, to win the debate. So that in combination with, I think, outweighing their extension, which is take their extension generously and um, believe everything they say. Why still does it lose to you the material in your speech? It makes it again very difficult for the op whip uh, because they both have to then show that no, the mechanisms we provide you are correct. But that's also insufficient because even if they provide the mechanisms, you've proven that it's just not important. So they have to do both of those things. So putting lots of pressure on your op whip speaker is really important. Um, and you can do that often by asking the, the very quick rebuttal questions I had, which is, is this comparative? Is this the tipping point, et cetera, et cetera. You labeling something is uncomparative will take five seconds to do. At most, it'll take you a 10 to 15 second explanation if it's complex. But an op whip demonstrating, no, no, our case is in fact comparative, is a lengthy process. Most op whips will have to take a long time to do that. So try and find things that don't take you very much time to uh, argue 
the, the CEO case struggles with, but will take a lot of time for the op whip to reconstruct. And that's how I think I'd go about gov whip and putting um, the, the CEO team under, under pressure. And this allows you by, by making prioritizing weighing and those structural responses to do all of the other stuff, prioritizing your rebuilding, um, doing all of the explicit weighing against the other sides, et cetera. The one thing that I'd flag is normally when I'm speaking gov whip, by the time um, the member for the opposition stands up, I will have written the vast majority of my speech for the top half out already. So you wanna do nothing but provide your, um, provide your undivided attention to the op member speaker, because if you're doing something else, then chances are you will lose to that CEO team. Um, awesome. Uh, I very quickly want to look at tracking the debate because this also came up, how best you can go about that. Um, and then an analysis extensions. Okay. Uh, first analysis extensions, I guess that's the best order going. So one of the questions that uh, I often get asked is, well, like if I just have more and more reasons um, why something is true, how do I actually win? It seems pretty difficult, right? Because the, the opening has uh, decent reasons as to why something is the case um, and they burn a lot of material. I'm on the back foot. Seems pretty difficult to win. And I want to flag here that uh, it is, it is a, a tendency of many people to um, think that taking a second is a bad thing and it isn't a bad thing. So analysis extensions in some instances may not allow you to win debates, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's a testament to a very good opening that has left you with so little material that you have to prioritize running simply analysis. And it's okay to take the second behind that team. But if you have an analysis extension, uh, focusing all of your time on trying to win may be a bad strategy. So it's really important to honestly assess are the reasons that I'm contributing to a particular argument from the opening team, other pieces of analysis that I'm contributing, reasonably able to, to be proven as better? And if you put yourself in the judge's shoes and ask that and come to the conclusion, no, it would take way too long to demonstrate that they're more important and the, the explanation will be tenuous, then it might actually be a better strategy to focus on heavily responding to the other side um, and, uh, and, just, and just standing behind the unique benefits that come from a couple of the, the unique reasons you give. So you might give some more reasons as to how, uh, for example, legalizing drugs means that people reach out for help. Um, you might do that. Um, but that also might have additional smaller impacts. Like, for example, you're more likely to reach out to your family for some for some reason and what the impact of that might be. That uh, is obviously a secondary impact and the main impact is the same as your opening, but using those secondary impacts to then weigh against heavy, heavy, heavily responded to material from the other side might be the way that you uh, decide you want to engage with the bank and take uh, a second instead. But that being said, I actually do think in most instances, you can take a first uh, by running analysis extensions. Uh, it just requires a lot of honesty and a lot of discipline. So the first thing is, I think um, it's really important to critically track what the opening is saying um, because they will miss extremely obvious things. One of the debates that I think a lot of CG teams found annoying at Thailand worlds was on abolishing the Olympics because most of the intuitive arguments for abolishing the Olympics would be selected by the opening team. Whilst that is true, you would be surprised to see how many obvious arguments or reasons for abolishing the Olympics uh, the, the opening might have forgotten and how it's easy to weigh them. So this, I think what this requires is you writing all of the reasons that they give all of the reasons that you uh, have that are distinct and directly comparing them as if you would characterization or internal weighing we are talking about earlier. Uh, so one of the silly ways that I have taken a first, I had taken a first in that Olympics debate is there was a clash on 
um, for example, people in slums being driven out as a result of um, governments trying to find the land that they can build stadiums on, et cetera, for the Olympics. Uh, and the opening gives some reason as to why it might be slum, slum dwellers, because it is the case that they have the least political capital. Uh, we realized that they didn't run the very obvious argument that this land is uh, often the the cheapest land to be able to build stadiums on and therefore governments would prioritize this more than any anything else and that argument on cheap land which is just a, a basic and really stupid stupid claim if you think about it something that an opening should think about but if given we track them properly we realized they didn't weighed that and showed that it was more plausible than the political capital claim and were able to therefore claim the benefits by showing that the mechanisms that we were providing were more um, were more plausible and um, and were more more directly linked to the end outcome that they were arguing for, uh, and that might be a way you do it. But it requires very meticulous tracking. So I think when you're in in debates where you realize, hey, there's not that much material on our side, it's really important then to be disciplined as a whip speaker and write down exactly what your opening is saying because you know that there's a chance you might run an analysis extension and almost be like, our opening said X thing. Uh, that is fine. We're gonna, we said Y thing. Here's why X thing is less important than Y thing in pursuit of Z outcome. Here's why X, here's why cheap land is a more compelling reason as to why slum, slum uh, people who live in slums will be driven out than their access to political capital and doing an explicit way up there would be the way that you go about it. But it requires um, that you track the, the case, honestly. The other thing is, obviously, for a lot of judges, hearing new reasons for the same thing might come across as derivative and they might have doubts. And one way you can overcome that doubt is by just flagging. Like, yeah, we're just going to credit our opening with all of the material that they had about um, people in low SES communities being driven out. Uh, all of those reasons you can attribute to them. What we will uniquely bring is these these three or four reasons. And you might you might have been in a debate where that didn't work for a team, but the most uh, common reason why that doesn't work for a team is that they then just repeat reasons that the opening had said. If you honestly say, yeah, these were reasons one, two, three that the opening brought, and here's the the other three reasons that we will bring, and they're actually honest, um, then the judge will be like, yeah, that's fair enough. Let's see how these reasons play out rather than you disingenuously claiming you're going to contribute something to the debate when you're when you're not um so don't repackage mechanisms and and analysis that has come out it's often like not that useful pick ones that are, are new instead and just be honest about the fact that they they are new reasons for the same argument or a new characterization for the same argument uh, so that's how I'd go about weighing analysis extensions, uh, a particularly pre prevalent problem given uh, motions are becoming increasingly shallow and CA teams think uh, less and less about the depth of motion, sadly. Um, okay, final thing on tracking debates. Um, I got a lot of questions on how do I fix my notes, et cetera. I think there are just two stages to, to tracking that make it uh, very easy. Uh, if any of you have seen me debate, I like use, I think um, nine markers, nine different colored like markers in a debate, three shades of green, three shades of like pink and three shades of blue, one for each team and different shades re represent um, different parts to a particular team's case. So for example, uh, blue is normally for opening government. So the darkest shade of blue will be about what their argument and largest impact are. The medium shade of blue, the, the less, the, the sort of one in between will be what the specific mechanisms are. And then the lighter shade of blue will be my comments. So it'll be a comment right underneath. This is uncomparative. This is not the tipping point. This characterization is un incorrect. Um, this does not engage with X, whatever it might be. And that allows me to, um, you know, prioritize the most important stuff because I'm listening, identifying what the most important mechanisms set out by each of the teams are. But I've already done a lot of the legwork by making comments, by thinking critically about how uh, the case is coming out. 
And those comments make it very easy for me to copy responses down to a piece of paper. So normally um, you can do both simultaneously so you can track. And when you think a team is focusing on less relevant issues in the debate that you can easily respond to without doing a whole lot of writing, you might transcribe the most important write-up that you had in tracking into your speech and, and do all the rebuttal stuff there. Um, but as I said, I think a rule of thumb is generally by the time you begin the closing, you should have all of the reasons why you've beaten your opening already written out. Um, because if you think critically as their material is coming out and you're writing material uh, and you're writing your speech as it's going, um, there should be no reason why you would have to write a whole host of stuff for top half while CEO is speaking, for example. So doing as much hard work as possible early is uh, probably the way to go with respect to tracking. But I, the, the other thing that I'd say is uh, it's actually not that important unless uh, in, in, in select instances, for example, when you're running an analysis extension, obviously writing almost everything that your opening is saying on a given issue that you're also running with is, is important. But uh, in the majority of instances, you don't have to write anything, everything rather that the other team says. You just have to pinpoint what is the big uh, argument slash impact? What are the big mechanisms that this relies on? Uh, and what are my comments on those things? And as long as you go argument slash impact, two or three big mechanisms, my comment for each of the arguments from the other team, you've written a sufficient amount you don't have a huge amount of paper to deal with. You don't have a huge amount to stuff into your speech. It's just the most important material that's coming out. Uh, so you're prioritizing your, your analysis correctly. Um, if you do write a lot, for example, and are able to decipher what is important and what is not, um, and uh, find the, the need to write lots, I would go back to the checklist I had about how to prioritize material and then vet all of the comprehensive notes you've taken with that checklist and then transcribe your speech based on that. So when you rewrite your speech, you have a very specific focus um, rather than just writing everything down at once. Uh, so that's what I'd say about tracking the debate. Um, I believe that is, uh, no, yeah, okay. Finally, um, a discussion of new material. So I made a comment um, about how I think the, the place to put new material that sort of straddles the line is in the rebuilding phase um, because for some reason judges are less likely to pick up on it when they're bolstering pre-existing reasons for extension rather than if they're just brand new piece of material in response or something like that. So I think for the most part uh, you can get away with not presenting explicitly new material but material that is kind of new but goes to things that have already been said so new characterization for a mechanism that already exists um or uh a, a piece of um response that you're giving to the other side that might um, argue that incentives actually exist in another sense these are all acceptable ways to go about it but providing mechanisms for why uh your an, an extension stands is in in my opinion like the absolute line that shouldn't be crossed. I think most judges are sensible enough to see that this is clearly something that if you're at WIP, for example, and are providing new mechanisms for material, like that's pretty unacceptable. And I think one of the tactics that works at GovWIP, for example, if you find that an op member has not actually done much mechanistic work, is flagging for a judge that a, a op WIP cannot add that much new material because uh, it is just against um the, the the rules of the activity um so making sure you you do that and making clear for the judges what is okay and what is not um the last thing that i want to flag is not here explicitly um but i think is one of the the issues that is that i see quite often and that people don't seemingly discuss and that is repeating responses i think much like material um that comes out in the extension speech having to be new if you just repeat responses that your opening gives to oo for example and claim it to yourself i think that most sensible judges would not credit that so find alt obviously you can flag that opening opposition opening government gives this response and it's pretty effective 
in in reducing the extent of opening opposition's claim um, and, and flagging that for the judge is, is fine. But in order for you to win that explicit comparison, you will have to give new responses. So don't rely on responses that have already come out in the debate, because much like uh, having derivative material, der derivative responses can actually harm you in debates. Um, so, so that's important. Uh, I think the last thing that I had here on new material is I, I actually don't, I don't have a, um, a very strong opinion on what new material is or is not. I think the community should discuss how material ought to be evaluated. And I think a lot of instances it's on a case by case basis as to what can be credited or not. Um, if you at WIP are like, have a gut feeling that the material that you're going to forward in your speech is gonna be thrown out. Or if you as a judge were looking at that material and say, obviously this is new, then don't write it in your whip speech. Um, so a lot of this is discretionary actions that you take um, and judgment calls that you make, um, which will be based on, on the nature of the round and the judging panel you have, et cetera. So that would be my advice on new material. Um, great, I think that's the end of the, the slide slides and my um, actual, the actual lecture. Um, I think, what I'll do now is take questions from both the YouTube stream and in the comments here. So um, one of the questions we got was, um, when opening runs a principled case and your extension is utilitarian, how do you weigh your extension against the opening team? Um, I think this is often contingent on the nature of the arguments that come out. Um, it is very difficult to prove the ontological cases or principled cases, unfortunately, in debating, because most judges don't really know how to weigh that material. Um, so you will have intuition on your side. Uh, but the best way to often do it is to show that the actual principled case is contingent on some kind of practical outcome anyway. So if a um, team is running that you have a right to freedom of religiosity or something like that. Uh, if your extension proves that that access to freedom of religiosity increases, you bypass that and enable their principal case to stand. So doing some legwork at closing to show that essentially the principal material is actually practically contingent, which is pretty easy to do in most instances, is often a really good way to go about that uh, because most principles aren't constructed in a fully self-sustaining um, self way and often have practical contingencies and just pointing out what those are and that you make those principles more, more true essentially, uh, then you can, you can weigh those, those principles pretty easily. Um, we have another question, which is specifically in the context of top rooms and out rounds, how can I deliver a whip speech that frames out the other side and also frames out the opening of my side? Um, I mean, this is a strange, strange question in the sense that I think in most top rooms, teams will not have gotten debates so badly wrong that a frame will be sufficient to get rid of them. In most top rooms, what uh, teams are arguing for is usually on clash with the rest of the debate. So if you're relying entirely on a frame, framing out of other teams to win the debate, chances are that you're going to lose. But also, um, I think a lot of framing, unfortunately, in the way that it plays out in debating is contingent on who has how much clout or rep in the, cir in the circuit, um, which means that if you're a team, if you're debating a European champion and they say, obviously, your frame is ridiculous, um, it, that might stick because we haven't, unfortunately, as a debating community, formalized the ways in which we prioritize different frames. So I think it's legitimate to um, frame out the other side and your opening by showing that the material that you have is completely different and more important. But I would always couple it with an explanation of even if the frame is, uh, is not true in essence, or the other side's frames are true, why you win under that frame, just so you aren't relying entirely on something that 
is based on the judge's intuitions, but instead of relying on analysis that can be weighed directly. Uh, so you want to give, you want to minimize the discretion the judge has to screw you essentially. Um, another question is, if we need to balance rebuttal and weighing, which responses should we prioritize? Let's say we have five responses, but we know we don't have sufficient time for them and a comparative. Um, I think obviously uh, you, you prioritize um, the, the most important responses and weighing, like I don't deliver 10 responses to everything. I deliver them to sufficiency such that I know, uh, okay, I've reduced the other side's benefits enough and I've built up my own benefits enough such that if I do the way up now, it'll be very clear to the judge that I win. So give enough responses such that you're at the point where you're convinced that your, your case is more important or your scale is larger or your intensity is greater than the other side and then do the way up there um, rather than you know absolutely destroying the other team's case but not having enough time to provide a comparative or doing the weighing because that means a lot of the work that you've done will, uh, will not actually get recognized. Okay, um, another question is how to improve tracking, balancing between thinking of rebuttals, thinking of rebuttals and comparison and shaping your extension with your partner and making sure you heard claims and understood any relevant claims. Um, I think a lot of it goes to like uh, what I was saying. So the the five sort of checklist things that I, that I had in, um, the presentation of ways that you can think about the other side's material um, or, or your own openings material is actually an effective way to do it. So say you're listening to your opening and you're like, oh, obviously this is uncomparative or not the tipping point. You can turn to your partner and say, hey, if we just prove that we just prove that we have a comparative benefit that is also the tipping point, we can win the debate in that sense. Um, you are able to both contribute to the extension, have responses to the other side, or, um, and also weigh against your opening in a way that makes it quite quite easy. So the key to all of balancing all of these is critically thinking and asking questions as claims come out, not just writing them down. And then after you've written them down, thinking about why they're incorrect. As a claim comes out, much like you would as a judge, critically analyzing those claims is the key to balancing all of these different priorities. Um, we have another question. What are some of the tactics or mechanisms you do to do you use to do internal weighing um, when two teams are reaching for the same type of impacts? Okay. Um, so I think there are a few things here. The first thing that you can do uh, with respect to internal weighing is providing the the characterization or a description of what the on the ground realities are. Um, for, for the debate. So for instance, uh, if it's a lot of debates about like international relations are often about various incentives that uh, international organizations or states have. And one of the ways that you might go about it is by providing an accurate characterization of what the on the ground conditions are such that your reason is more likely than the others. So they say that um, Narendra Modi will act in X way. We say that Narendra Modi will act Y way. But what their claim for, does not recognize or acknowledge is the characterization on the ground, which is obviously why our side is the one that's correct. Um, so thinking about characterization on the ground is often a really good way to do internal weighing. The other, uh, the other means through which you can think about internal weighing is just um, in terms of scale or plausibility. Uh, so what are the incentives of specific people describing those incentives and then showing why your claim is um, your claim is more likely, I guess, to uh, align with those incentives. Cool. We have a question, um, some interesting questions. Uh, one is, is it possible to rebut when you don't really understand the op? Can I, um, can I for instance, use rhetoric to rebut? Uh, I mean, apparently you can, um, but I would suggest that you probably shouldn't. Um, if you don't understand the op, uh, I would focus most of my time on um, trying to trying to understand what their benefits or impacts are, uh, and then most generously thinking about their mechanisms from there. Um, 
and trying to intuit what they would be and then weighing against those. Or if you can't even do that, I would suggest just focusing a lot on building your own impacts and benefits and extension and showing why they win in and of themselves. Cool. Uh, Chet Chetanya asks, uh, what can I do if I feel like judges aren't able to understand my principle? Um, I think you engage in a lot of intuition pumps and um, uh, thought experiments that ground um, a lot of the, the principles that you're arguing for. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be no real coherent way in which judges uh, evaluate principles, but the best you can do is by trying to show why the, the principle that you're forwarding is actually not at odds with the intuition that people have at all. Um, so claims about human dignity, for example, uh, drawing parallels about why people uh, have individual rights or thought experiments, for example, about how you wouldn't sacrifice individuals, uh, one individual and all of their organs to save people. These are classic thought experiments that you should supplement all of your um, principled analysis with. Uh, the last question is, uh, can you discuss the questionable 2020 world semi-final decision uh, and what you could have done in the in your whip speech to go through? Uh, wow, these questions are quite savage. Um, I mean, I think this goes to a lot of the principal material that I was saying, uh, but uh, the unfortunate reality is that often it is quite difficult to uh, succeed at this activity when you have to overcome a whole bunch of, of social obstacles and rep obstacles and compete against teams that have friends on CA teams, et cetera. But all you can do is try and commit yourself and be disciplined and the rest is in the, in the hands of the judge. So um, I would say generally uh, debating is quite an unpredictable activity unlike other sports. It's really important just to give yourself the best chance and go from there. Cool. Uh, if there are no other questions, which there seemingly are not, uh, unless there are more from the YouTube chat. Um, there doesn't seem to be. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we'll end it there. Thank you everyone for uh, joining me today. I hope that was helpful to some extent. I'm sure the slides will be posted and you can access them. Um, I guess my parting words are just, um, to be very disciplined and to remember that through your whip speech, you just have to really put yourself ahead on three explicit comparisons from other teams and trying to make sure that you do so efficiently with your responses, et cetera. Um, and as long as you're cognizant of that objective, um, you're, you'll be able to win most debates from whip. Um, good luck for uh, anyone who's debating at Euros or otherwise. Um, and I'm, I think the slides will be posted for you guys to access later. Cheers.